one of the other sort of elements of the story which is so, I think, antithetical to what we usually see in Western mythology. So there's a woman at the heart of this story mm -hmm. also, um, Draupadi, and she has five husbands. Yeah. Um, you know, actually this is something in the writer's room, so to speak, that we've sort of struggled with. Like, how do you really kind of portray this? Um, but can you talk about that? Because I think it's sort of like an interesting window in again into a different type of storytelling. Well, I think it, what you have to do is take these things for granted. Okay, here's a story where a woman has five husbands in it. You know, this, the way it happens in the story makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you think about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And this is a culture where, you know, normally in, in, in the last couple of hundred years, if, if you wanted to live in that world, you had to become a Mormon. And really, it was, it was guys with ten wives, but what we've got here is a wife with five guys, you know. It's a very different power dynamic. And she's a, an immensely powerful character. In fact, it's the, very, the smallest of actions to do with this character and Krishna actually is what triggers a war and it's part of what I love about it. It's the single tear of a woman who's being basically abused by not, not the five husbands but by the enemies of these people and, and she's kind of mocked and humiliated and she cries and from this tear Krishna basically decides to destroy the age and, and initiate this battle which will wipe out everyone and, and replace the way the, the, the earth has functioned until that point with our own current age. So she's, in a, she's a very powerful figure. She's almost the, the Helen of Troy in this story, but in a very different way. And the way that she manipulates the characters throughout and the way that they respond to what she's doing are very, very important in this. So, yeah, I mean, she's a, a fascinating figure. I mean, the, the, all the female characters in this, because it's, it's very much a male epic because women didn't really fight in battles in those days. So we're kind of fudging that a little bit and letting the girls kick ass a little bit too. <laughs> well, the, the only thing I would add to that is even when you go back to the original myth and see how this woman was, you know, really uh, in many ways the leader of these five brothers in so many different ways, they, she was their spiritual center, she was a woman who they all admired and would do anything for, it's, it's very different than the patriarchal kind of perception mm -hmm. that we portray in a lot of these, these kind of shows and a lot of kind of content that we've seen in myths. So we really want to change that because I think when you go back to these ancient myths, the reverence they had for women and the respect they had for them, it was completely different than what has been maybe interpreted over time. Yeah. Yeah. But you do have to take it for granted that, okay, in this story, she's got five husbands, deal with it. <laughs> you know, I want to kind of talk about, you know, one of the really interesting things, again, is that you set this story in the future. I mean, it's an ancient myth. It's sort of a time before time myth, I think. But setting it in the future, why? And also, as we look at the world in which we live today, where science and technology is moving so fast, um, you know, um, if you look at social media and you just look at the ways in which we communicate that are so different than, say, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, you know, why did you set in the future and how much of what's happening in the world today, again, plays into what plays out in the story? Well, again, I mean, rather than set in the future, because I guess it's parts of it are, are actually set in the future, but the, the story's set more in a, a mythic, timeless time. And it could have happened 10,000 years ago, you know, there's that option as well. But one of the main things was, was that in, in the, the original text, they talk about how the technology of the third age is based around communications. And that's very much where we are right now, even though technically we're in the fourth age, their technology was based around communication. So we've got a lot of that kind of stuff in it. We've got their own versions of, you know, like telephones and computers, but they don't look anything like what we're familiar with. So I think it's, it's, it's about that, and because it's about the breakdown of communications as well, which is war, the ultimate breakdown of communication, it has a lot of reference points to where we live now and to surveillance culture and to see where their great technology has become kind of debased in our time into surveillance and wiretaps and, and you know, the, the cops on your phone. So yeah, I mean, it relates to all that as well, I think, but... Trud, I you and I, I know, share a fascination with, we spent a bunch of time with Ray Kurzweil, you know, talking about like the singularity and some of these concepts that are actually in this story. So can you also talk about actually sitting in your place where you do again in India? Because I, I think it's in, in so many ways, 
um, moving so fast. And when you talk about, you know, the spread of mobile technology as an example, um, sure. yeah, you know, no, how does that no. impact the story? Look, the, the one thing I think that what we wanted to show was a world where science and spirituality are not separated or divided. You know, they are integrated in a way. And I think 18 days, so if you look at kind of a lot of, you know, Western thought, it's, it's an either or. You know, science, superstition, uh, science and mysticism, they're, they're kind of very distinct. One is very rational, hard science, one is, one is very different. Whereas in the East, you'll have some of the most, or in India, which has seen such a dynamic explosion of such, you know, great booms in technology, engineering, science, you have people who are, you know, the top of their scientific chain going to the top engineering schools, working at top biotech firms, and then coming home and doing a 10,000-year-old ritual in puja, uh, and seamlessly seeing no disconnect. You know, they don't separate these two in the way that we have seen here in the West. And so what I think is interesting about this world that we're imagining in 18 days, this is a world where they are completely integrated. They were not chose to choose between one. They were chose to build upon them in a seamless way. So you've got people who are essentially kind of creating new beings, which we'll talk about. Drupadi, the wife of these five brothers, was in the original myth. She was born by an ancient ritual where a king prayed in a fire, and she was created. She was created fully formed in that point as the perfect woman. In ours, we're fusing that with not only these kind of, you know, uh, rituals and mysticism that is there, but also science, science and super technology of cloning. So it, it is probably a balance where we can see, uh, you know, and I think that's one of the most interesting parts that we see about India. I think you're going to have an ideological thought where they're not as divided as what we've seen in the West, even as they go ahead in the years. Yeah, and we love the idea also of, like, you know, when, someone, when you build a weapon nowadays, they're kind of on production lines. When you build telephones, they're on production lines. But in this world, everything is crafted, handcrafted by experts for individuals. So is that also not just functional technology, but beautiful technology that's been designed and like a gun would have filigrees and patterns on it and it'd be covered in jewels. So we want, to, again, it's that aesthetic and functional fused together. And a lot of, as Shirad says, a lot of what this does that you don't normally see of a lot in the West is to fuse opposites. There's a lot of fusing of opposites in this story and creating new things out of that fusion, which is the method of surrealism. You know, to take two things that don't normally fit together and make them into one new thing, the synthesis. So that's what we get, and it, it provides a lot of really interesting visuals, a lot of interesting concepts out of that, and it, it breaks down a lot of the barriers that we tend to have in our thought, which is dualistic rather than... Yeah, and even if you look at these ancient kind of texts that talk about, you know, essentially uh, a connected universe, a connected mind, people all being connected, which you'll see in many of the Eastern texts, uh, look at what we've become with the Internet. You know, look at how we've used technology to actually get to what these people were talking about thousands of years ago. I mean, kids don't study world history in te textbooks anymore. They have friends around the world that they're engaging with to learn from. Soon, as that Internet and people like Ray Kurzweil and others have hypothesized over the decades ahead, will become a part of us, whether it's Google Glasses today or a chip in our brain tomorrow. And at that point, we are all connected. We're connected no different than we are in an internet, but an internet that's inside us. So how far are we away from all these themes? I, I think we're not that far at all. Uh, like five years, yeah. I mean, did everyone see that they've, uh, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, even a month ago, that they've now actually managed to produce radio telepathy in rats, where they've implanted one rat, and when the rat gets hungry in London, the rat in Japan wants to eat and the two of them are functioning the same. So you consider that technology taking another 10 years when every kid has got one of these radio telepathic bugs implanted. That's going to be a very interesting world. And it will, again, this, this story, this ancient story, is talking about that world, which is, again, what makes it very contemporary. I think it's already happening, because you guys both took my next question straight out of my head. <laughs> but, you know, we were talking previously, uh, b prior to the panel, about yes. Grant, you were telling us about you know, 25 years ago when you first started coming to Comic-Con, you were describing it, and I was thinking to myself, like, the world itself was so different. Yeah. There was no Facebook, mm -hmm. there was no YouTube, there was no Twitter, there was no concept of social media. And so when you look at, like, how much a part of the world, not to mention, you know, this kind of what's happening here at Comic-Con, um, all of that stuff is today, where are we going to be 25 years, will you be here, first of all, and you yeah. know, where will we be in 25 years? What will this we'll place just be, look like? Everyone will be sitting pretending they're listening, but they'll be sending emails by blinking. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> 
And everyone will be talking to what seems to be themselves. You know, everyone will look like a crazy bum on the street in 10 years from, from now. Privacy will disappear because kids are constantly in touch and there'll be nothing to hide anymore, so they'll just be swapping thoughts. So it'll be really different. I mean, people like me who don't even have a phone are going to be completely lost. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I just don't stand, they'll all be standing around like taking the piss out of me. Well, I'm going, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> laughing. You know. So it's, I think it's actually going to change the, the way people feel that the human project itself could, could change quite radically within a short time. It's not to say it'll be, it'll be good or it'll be bad, it just is. It's been driven by technology and our desire to communicate at faster and faster speeds. So I, I do, it does seem inevitable that this will happen and it will be very, it'll be a very different world from the one we're in now. But yeah, 25 years ago when I first came here, and I, I was only 200 years old then, but the, 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 all I remember about San Diego is looking out my window and there's a guy dressed as Green Lantern being chased down the street by Marines, you know? <laughs> and he had nobody to call, there's no guardians, there's nothing. He's just running with these guys saying, you motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> and now, as I've said before, though, the Marines have just vanished into the background now because there's people here dressed as colonial Marines and space Marines and starship troopers. You don't know who's the good guys and who's the bad guys anymore. And they no longer know who to chase. <laughs> <laughs> Trud, what do you think? I mean, I want to know what your vision of the future is. Um, because again, I think you know, what you're seeing I and mean, what we talk about all the time uh, on the other side of the planet, um, there's, and, and in a, on a more serious note, I mean, there is a deep divide that certainly exists on the East between rich and poor, and there's the stratification that's happening. So what do you see and where do you see us in another 20 years? I'll, I'll tell you a story. When we first uh, started this idea, which was how, essentially, you know, I've been at this mission a long time, which was how do you spark a real creative, how, where do we find our Guillermo del Toro's, our Steven Spielberg's, our J.K. Rowling's in India? How do we give them a home? How do we give them a place to really create this innovative content that's beyond Bollywood, beyond all of this stuff, and then take it out to the world in the way we've seen Japan, Korea, China, all of these other indigenous markets find their own voice? And, you know, the best way that we've done that is really by mentoring and helping a lot of this talent work with people like Grant and finding similar voices around the world and starting to realize it's not just about India. But the story was that, you know, about 15 years ago when I first started on this journey, I, would, I went out to a, a village out in the remote part of India and, you know, I met a farmer who had a, who had a couple of kids and uh, probably making the equivalent of $100 a month and I asked him what his kids wanted to be when they grow up and his kids said farmer. They didn't think nothing about it. They just were in that role. They were happy. They were contented with it. I went similarly about, uh, about a year ago go to a similar type of place. I saw a farmer now making maybe $200 a month with two kids. I asked the kids what they wanted to be and they said Bill Gates. Uh, you know, and this is in a remote part of India. And I asked the parents what they were doing. They were putting 100 of those $200 away to teach the kid computer classes. So, you know, what I saw was a dichotomy. But then when you dig deeper, you find half of those guys teaching the classes are con men and hustlers. And still, you're getting a lot of interesting dynamism as this entrepreneurship takes form. But what it did show was there's an incredible desire, that same manifest destiny that drove so much of Western thought, of the hero, of the John Wayne archetype, or the fact that a man can make his own path has now become a lot of Eastern thought. They are very empowered by themselves that they can do something. They can be someone from a village to become anyone. Whereas in the East, we've got a, in the West, we have yoga studios everywhere. We have a lot of people that are, you know, kind of looking at the world and trying to find, I think, a more broader spiritual connection and their place in it. So I think the pendulum is swung in a place where it falls right in the center for both. And what's interesting about it is the exchange of those ideas from East and West are coming to a point where both sides are coming right to the center from different angles. And I think that's gonna be a very interesting point over the next few years. Uh, and never since Alexander the Great opened up the spice trade have we seen so much globalization so fast. So the next five years, everything we know is gonna change. The next 20 years, it's, it's, uh, it's a free for all. You know, the I, fact that even, we, we do, we, we live in a world where a lot of people are not familiar with some of the greatest stories that the human race has ever written. So it'll be great to introduce those stories to people who didn't even know they existed, you know, and they've been around entertaining people for thousands of years, and people still haven't heard of them. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I almost feel obligated to add my own point of view here, which is, you know, I, I, I think as many of you know, 
grew up inside the asylum, as I like to call it, with my dad, you know, Deepak Chopra, who's like one of those pioneers talking about yoga when it was very much considered still. I remember growing up in Boston, which is, you know, a relatively progressive place. Um, and we had people outside our house basically saying that my dad was bringing devil worship to the West. And I think we've <laughs> swung to the other side of um, extreme because yoga has sort of become so absurdly trendy um, in this country um, that there's probably like, I don't know, 25 yoga studios within a five mile radius of where we're all sitting right now. Um, and seriously, I mean, the amount of different yoga types I think there are, yeah. power yoga and rock yoga <laughs> and uh, I heard somebody ask me the other day about Kabbalah yoga, which... And there's this broga thing, have you heard this? Yeah. It's not even a word. <laughs> but it's, it's like a bunch of dudes doing yoga and they call it broga. <laughs> 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 